Hello, hello, hello. Today I am with Kapunzi Chidima of Lineage Luxury Handcrafted Accessories. I'm so excited because her products are just so dope and it's black owned luxury. Hello, we'll talk how she broke into the luxury handbag business and how we can really commit to buying from a luxury black owned brands. We'll also just get to hear her story and how she ended up being so su successful in her handbag business. So stay tuned. So I'm sitting here with Kakunzi and I'm just so excited to dig into today's topic. So just a quick introduction. Kapenzi is a master of business administration. She is the only woman Afro-Caribbean owned sustainably sourced luxury accessory and executive gift company in the market. Her collection consists of attache cases, portfolios, backpacks, unisex branded items. Her work has been featured um, in Neiman Marcus stores, uh, seen in media publications such as Essence, InStyle, Inspire, Uptown Magazine, you name it. So clearly she is doing something right. Please welcome uh, Ms. Kapinzi. So Kapinzi, thanks so much for coming on. Can you just tell us a little bit about how you got into the luxury handbag business? Sure, absolutely. I'm so excited to be here with you guys. It's really amazing. I'm so happy that you um, decided to interview me. I was super surprised. I didn't even know. I was like, well, I'm excited. I was just like, okay. I was like, really? She wants to interview me? So I'm super excited to be here. Um, <laughs> uh, I would say for me, I it was, you know, really by happenstance. It was never my uh, my overall intention. I actually started my career as a research scientist in my undergrad. I was a biology and criminal justice major. Wow. Graduated, took the regular course, decided to, I worked for, um, for DPC, which was Diagnostic Products Corporation. And then, then they transferred to Siemens. I was running DNA assays and immunoassay tests. And then one day, yeah, all of that, all the science, every last bit of the science was all my world. It was, it was all right here. So one day I just remember I had, cause of course, when you start out in research, they give you the grunt work. You get like all the bad, I mean, not the bad, just, you know, the entry level as you, as you should, you have to work your way up the chain. Right. And um, I can, you know, I can remember working in the lab and then one day catching a glimpse of myself cause it was like five o'clock in the morning. Cause I had the early shift. It was still dark outside. I had on goggles. I had a lab coat, I had a pocket protector with all the pins. Yes, everything you see in the movies, a calculator, my notebook, hair pulled back, thing on. Yeah. And I was just like, this cannot be my life. This this can't be it. This this just cannot be it. It can't. And in the lab, they're like, oh my God, you look so stylish. And I was like, I love fashion. I was like, I don't know if I love this anymore. So then I was like, well, how am I gonna make this career change? I was like, if I, you know, try to get a job, it's gonna take years. So mm -hmm. I decided I went back to school, got my MBA. My emphasis was on international business and fashion marketing. Yep. Uh, and then right the, you know, economy hit. So then there was another little blow. And right when that happened, I got a letter and they were like, Turkey is paying for, you know, African American, these ethnic groups to come to Turkey. We'll pay you to come here because they didn't have, you know, they were like, we need more diversity, we want people to come. So I was like, why not? I got a year to spare. Let's see what happens. And while I was there, I met some um, amazing people. I have some wonderful friends who have been absolutely supportive. And so I took the time off. Um, my mom and I are both very type A. She was a social worker and uh, and she also, I grew up with her owning a boutique. And then, you know, through this process of starting the business, I, um, she told me, she said, oh yeah, your, grand, your great grand used to design. And this, I was like, why did you guys never tell me this? Why did you let me foolishly go down the science path when you knew I should have been here? <laughs> and that was it. Well, wow, like what a 
whirlwind story. And I think a lot of people, including myself, you know, we grow up getting, you know, really kind of just tied into the sciences. And don't get me wrong, it's, it's wonderful to be in the sciences, but you know, being a creative can really open a lot of doors for you. You can really truly shine. And I felt mm -hmm. like being a creative entrepreneur was so, so important. So I'm glad that you eventually, you know, took that route and decided to, to do that. So that's very, very inspiring. Nice to hear your story. Um, tell me about the name Lineage uh, and what is the inspiration behind the name? Um, so growing up, my, well, to me, anyone who knows me knows that my family is everything, like family, friends, anyone who I invite in my home, like, these are people who are <clears throat> very special to me. Wow. And when I was, you know, trying to come up with the name, a really good friend of mine, um, disagree. She, oh, she's a sister. So, Oh, um, you know how you throw out all those names like je ne sais quoi, da, 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 all those right. really kind of fanciful things and she was like but does that really speak to who you are and who what you want and growing up you know one of the prayers my mom always said was you know we want to leave this world better than better than we found it for those that come after us and I was like okay and so I started trying to find words that kind of you know spoke to that for me and then I don't know, I was listening to something they're like, oh, your lineage is important and this. And I was like, that's it. So okay. the yeah, phonetic spelling of lineage stuck. And I feel like it's something because I'm my goal is to make sure this company is here for many generations. I wanna, you know, I wanna create generational wealth as well as um, not just for myself, but for my community. Definitely. It's so important to want to do that and I love how your brand and your company, you can, you can feel, you can feel that it runs deep and it's really, really passionate, you know, it's really, really something that you care about. And I know you've mentioned your mom and a lot of people in your family, and we're going to dig into that mm -hmm. a little bit in terms of what your inspiration was for your work. Um, but before we do that, can you just tell me a little bit about what, what is your design process? You know, tell us about your handbags. How do you go from start to finish? Okay. Well, I will say that the design process for me is rudimentary at best. Let's be clear. I am no artist. I am, mm -mm, no. I have an amazing team that I work with. So I give them, I call it chicken scratch on a pad. Oh. And my ateliers like to look at it and they'll be like, madam, madam, I just, madam, tell me what you want and we'll, we'll work it out. <laughs> well, I mean, they <laughs> so, um, we work, it, it, we work really well together because I come up like, you know, you see some of those fancy models and I'll have the cat with the specs and the this. Mm -hmm. We are very much old school in my, in my uh, workroom. Wow. We are very much, you know, I, I'll see it. I'm really inspired by, um, random things like I I'll see like an ice cube and I'll be like huh that could be a nightmare you right. know like different like I saw like a stop I actually have a bag my like, they hate making it I love selling it it works out and it's called it's I called the stop sign bag but it's shaped almost like a stop sign uh -huh. they hate making it because of all the little edges but I'm like it looks so pretty and it's a different shape uh huh is it blue? Yes. Okay, okay. Because I think I saw it on your website, and I think actually that was my favorite bag. Um, so mm -hmm. we're gonna, we're gonna they hate it. <laughs> they hate making it. <laughs> so we're going to take a look at some of the pictures in a second. But um, yes, yeah, so you work with a atelier. Did I say that right? Or atelier. atelier. Yes, awesome. atelier. So in Turkey. <laughs> It's, it's one of those um, in Turkey, they have, um, so because um, I guess handcrafting and leather working and all of those are skills that have been passed on generationally. Turkey is also one of the few countries that didn't have the slave trade. So when going there, so for me, when I, when I first went there, it felt different being there. And when I decided to go into the, when I decided I wanted to go into luxury and not just have 
and not that there's anything wrong with it, but I want, I've always wanted a crocodile bag. I always wanted, I always love like crocodile and python and all these really soft things and really soft leathers and whatnot. Yeah. But what I found was, you know, when I started here to get in, to be, to be given the opportunity to see those materials was not given to me. So I would walk in the showroom and they would show me what they felt that I should, in a sense, what they felt I should be working with. Wow. And I was like, but that's not what I want. Like what I want is this. And, but when I went to go buy those things, it wasn't shown to me. So mm. when I really started like looking for partners and who to work with, and I decided like, you know, I didn't want to just be another company like fast fashion that was out there just you know, going out into a while and being like, oh, I want this and I want that. I was like, well, how can we make this work better? And so a friend of mine was like, have you thought about looking at farms? And I was like, a farm? He was like, yeah, you know, they, they throw, sometimes they throw those skins away. And I was like, somebody is throwing away. I was like, you're just going to waste the baby. So, but they I mean, they don't waste it. They use it for compost and they'll use it. But depending on how rural the area is, yeah. it may just be compost. And I'm like, so this beautiful, beautiful skin. Um, so I really made it a mission to just work with, um, farms and co-ops and places that were really, um, you know, didn't needed another revenue stream one, and then two allowed me to, um, allow, allowed me to actually get access to these materials. And that was something that I was missing when I was working with vendors here. Wow, that is so interesting because really you are going right at the source. And mm -hmm. um, I think that also gives you a lot of creative control um, in terms of just all the details that go with producing the bags. And uh, I just also found it interesting how you said that when you went out to go purchase certain things, they didn't show you what you wanted. You know what I mean? Like, I want the good stuff. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> and you're not going to show me the, the messed up stuff I want the good stuff so I just and it, amazing. it was nice but I was like what else do you have like there has to be and they're like oh we can do this and I was like but that doesn't that ain't I mean, it. that's not mm -mm. I was like there is something let me tell you when you pick up a python bag shot let me tell you your whole I can have on a jogging I don't care I can have on a jogging suit I don't care you put that bag in my hand, let me tell you. You feel, you feel it. You just feel it, you feel differently. Like I gave my, my sister and I carry the same bag and some of my friends would be like, why do y'all do that? But it's Italian leather with an ostrich pocket. It's not, I just can't, I just love it. Yeah, so with that being said, um, it seems like you definitely have an eye for things that are chic stylish like how would you describe your style of your brand i would describe my brand style is very um i would say very classic um very streamlined um a, a touch of modern but not trendy definitely um i want pieces because for me personally i feel like if i'm asking someone to spend their hard-earned money and spend, you know, X amount of dollars on a product. I want it to be something that if they, you know, wear it for years or if they decide to step away from it, they can come back to it and still, and it will still be relevant and they'll still be able, you know, to wear it and not feel like, oh my God, why did I buy this? So for me, that's really important. Definitely. And I kind of sense that also too from your, from your products, like, you know, me, I'm not really big on logos and mm -hmm. I don't think that I can wear forever. And I think it's important to have brand awareness, don't get me wrong. And um, I myself, I have a logo, but I'm just saying in a sense of, um, I feel like sometimes it's about just being simple and mm -hmm. being, that's just elegant and classy. And I really sense that from, from your brand uh, as well. So um, switching gears a little bit, could you tell... Um, could you tell us any challenges that you have met with becoming a business owner, being Black and being a woman? What are some challenges that you have faced? Um, I would say for me, uh, entering, like I said before, entering the luxury market, it's, it's difficult. It's definitely 
not a space where I feel, um, there are oftentimes where I feel like say, oh, we want you, but no, you want me as a consumer, not as a producer. Mm. And I found that there is, um, that there's sometimes unconscious biases that people have when you say, no, I own this versus, oh, I work for the company. So there have, and I feel like you have to be strategic and sometimes you have to know which battle you want to fight that day. So I would definitely say that there's a lot of biases when it comes to um, who should be in the luxury space, how you should be in this space, and then what you're given access to. And that comes from not just from an ethnic perspective, but also from a gender perspective, because while women are the largest consumers of fashion or one of the largest consumers of fashion, when it comes to manufacturing of fashion, we are absolutely the minority. And that's where women as a whole, and then when you drill down into the ethnic side of, um, of fashion and who you see represented when you're going to these spaces and you're looking for these items, um, on the manufacturing side, you don't, you don't see us really. Mm. Yes, I mean, speak on that. Like, you know, we as Black women, our, our spending power is amazing. Right, like uh, mm -hmm. when you look at the the stats, uh, we spend a lot, and we also uh, determine the trends. So mm -hmm. it's important that we are at the seats uh, when it comes to being the people who are producing and making profit from it, and having mm -hmm. the and thriving. So that's why I mean that's the whole reason why I'm interviewing you because <laughs> it's really a big deal. I don't think that you know, but I can. I'm truly inspired by the fact that your product is this elegant and this luxury and you have navigated through this realm that, at, at, you know, we used to just seeing white males pretty much. Yeah, it's definitely male. It's definitely male dominated industry, definitely Caucasian male dominated. Um, so I would say the biggest, you know, and one of the things like when you're doing trade shows, I think being culturally aware is also something that you, and culturally aware and culturally sensitive, because there will be instances where, you know, you're traveling to different countries for trade shows and things like that. And oftentimes I think as, um, as African-American women, we're not, sometimes we, we don't get the exposure or some of us don't get the exposure to, you know, to some of these different cultural um cultural norms and things. And so I would say one of the most challenging things for me is to be in a different space that I'm not comfortable with. Mm. And then something happened. Cause I can remember being on um, a buying trip at a trade show out of the country. And in this particular case, and it was one of the only times I've ever like called home and been like, I want to come home. I can't stand Aww. here. I just called my sister crying. Me and my, um, my colleague who were there together, we're both in the room crying. We're like, this is side up for this because we were in a place that had different, you know, different laws and different ways or how they treat women. Mm -hmm. And, you know, looking back at it, had I, had I known more and I would have been like, oh, so this is not for me. I'm going to send a man here or I will make sure to bring my own man or somebody with me because, right. you know, these are things that you have to be, you know, aware of. And, you know, we don't always get told that even in business school, they you know, they tell us about cultural norms and cultural sensitivity, but when you're actually in it and living it completely different. Wow. Right. Yeah. I mean, I think, you know, just being an entrepreneur and going into these different fields, you know, you are exposing yourself to places and you're learning a lot because, and I think just in general, we're always kind of the minority. So being in these mm -hmm. places can sometimes just be a process within itself. You're trying to figure out how do I navigate this space, you know, and people here don't really look like me. Um, so that is, it's brave just inherently because of that. Um, Tell us a little bit about where has some of your, um, where have your products been featured and kind of what was your most, I guess, favorite feature thus far in terms of where your, your, um, your bags have been? Well, we, I've done a, I've done a few trunk shows at Name and Marcus, as you mentioned, at their North Park store. I've been featured in Dallas Modern Luxury, um, Uptown Magazine. One of my favorite publications, uh, the Blade Magazine, um, the editor-in-chief, Troy, he's amazing. Ladies, if you're looking for work with Troy, he's amazing. Um, but Tanya Christensen at Essence, 
gave me like essence in the black household like that is essence I mean it's like your essence and it's absolutely everything but she you know reached out to me I didn't even I was like how did she get my number how did she find me what's going on and so yeah <laughs> found me and she was like, oh, send, can you send us a few samples? We'd like to feature you. And I was like, first of all, I don't know who this is. Second of all, and I was like, let me do my research. And I was like, right? huh. And all I could do was put a, a bunch of bags in a box. And I said, well, Lord, if this is a scam or kind of, well, we'll just chalk it up to thank God I have business insurance and we're just gonna let it be. But it wound up being the best experience ever that has absolutely been one of my favorite because it was completely unexpected it definitely I mean growing up you know you see essence and never did I ever imagine anything I made or you know had would be in you know essence magazine and then I was in the issue that had uh, Michelle Obama on the cover so that was like wow, even better yeah so it was amazing <laughs> Well, that's awesome. I mean, I definitely think, you know, the fact that a, a household name like X Essence reached out to you shows kind of the level and caliber of your work. So that is something that's definitely, you know, noteworthy. And I'm, I'm so excited for you that that happened to you. Um, I do want to switch gears a little bit and talk about um, some more of, I know you, you're bringing awareness to Huntington's disease. Um, yes. You have a, on your website a collection um, dedicated to Huntington's disease. So tell me more about this and kind of explain this philanthropic effort. Okay, so um, Huntington's disease, it's a hereditary degenerative disorder. Basically, way I describe it is you have ALS, Parkinson's, and Alzheimer's all in one. Wow. And for my family, it's, it's a heavy, it's a heavy little cookie. And, um, I'm very, my, my family and I have been very active with the organization. I'm on the board. I drag my sister on the board and do events <laughs> all the time. Yeah. Um, <laughs> my, so my first, uh, interaction with it was with my, my grandpa. So mm -hmm. it, it can manifest and it can look like the person is drunk all the time or whatever their cognitive ability is impaired. And if you're not familiar with it, you may just chalk that up to, oh, that person just has a drinking problem. Mm -hmm. And luckily for us, um, my grandpa was, um, he served in the military mm -hmm. um, in the medical unit. And so he had access to VA benefits. And one of the doctors there um, was like, you know, let's run this test. I think this may, this may not be what is the problem. And so when they did, they diagnosed him with, um, with Huntington's disease. And so after that, then the rest of the family was like, okay, because it's a genetic disorder um, and it's passed from father to daughter so then all the girls of course got tested and um, unfortunately fortunately, my auntie my mom well two aunties and my mom all have Huntington's disease mm. and um, and so with that happening uh, you know it, it really it really really caused me to be like okay how can I fix this because Mm -hmm. Then I tapped back into my, you know, like my science background. I was like, well, what I, I went into initially went into research mode. Like, what is this going to mean? How is this going to affect us? And it's degenerative. And so I, and people I love dearly, you know, make that transition and go from being these vibrant, outgoing, you know, people to basically not being able to walk, basically being bedridden. Mm -hmm. And because it basically, at the end, it makes your bone, every, all your muscles kind of curl. Everything just kind of curls in. And so my mom had it, um, we recently lost my mom, well, yeah, last year, uh, December 6th. And so um, throughout this process, I know in some places, like the families would hide their loved ones. And for us, that was never an option. It was very much, um, I didn't want to, we didn't want to hide her. So in starting a business, like there would be times then she would be like, what can I do? And she's like, I want a job. I'd be like, Ma, you have a job. Your job today is stuffing the bags. Mm -hmm. And she'd look at me, she'd be like, what do you mean? I was like, girl, you, the bags over there, they're not gonna um, pack themselves. And so we would 
I would, you know, give her things because the goal is to really keep them involved. And so I started the collection because since it's not really um, a disease that has a lot of awareness for it, and um, oftentimes because it affects people like right in their prime er er earning um, years. And so my mom had to stop working when she was probably like in her like mid fifties, like, because mm. um, it affects your cognitive ability. So, and I found that, you know, healthcare in the US is very expensive and I wanted to find a way to give back and, um, and really, help people would have a good time. We would be in there laughing. There'd be times I'd be like, mama, why don't you shake my protein shake? I was like, you shake all the time. And she was like, I do, huh? Let me get to shaking. <laughs> and we would have so much fun. And so working with HDSA and wanting to give back to caregivers is something important to me. And ultimately um, the goal for lineage is to have a medical side. And I wanna open up a medical resort because with being a caretaker, you find that there's no really, there's no real resources and, um, or it's very expensive. And so I, the goal ultimately will be to have, there's going to be, of course, handbag being rooms, of course, it has to be, <laughs> but, but it will be a place where people can come, caregivers can get the press, they can feel comfortable leaving their loved ones and, I really, our goal is to really find a cure, but until we can find a cure, I want people to be out there having a good time, not hiding. And if, you know, you have a little shake, I mean, girl, you got a shimmy in your walk. It's okay. Everybody needs a shimmy. And, you know, you just kind of just go that way. Wow. So definitely, thank you so much for sharing that. And uh, I really appreciate your vulnerability. It's not easy. Uh, and just how your family's story and everything is just so intimately woven in your product just makes it even mean more, you know? And um, I love how you want to transition it and really bring awareness to Huntington's because you're right. Not a lot of people know about it at all. And um, I, I actually mm -hmm. heard about it before because of my profession, but mm -hmm. I, it's not something that we commonly see. So I think that you are kind of ahead of the curve and really kind of taking that stance there. And I think you're just also amazing because you chose to keep going. You know what I mean? Like you, there's a lot of things that's going on with your family and you lost your mom, which is a big, you know, life event. So to keep going is like, yes. yeah, Kapenzi, like pat yourself on the back. Like that's a big deal. <laughs> some people, you know, it takes them a while. And I just really admire your your perseverance and your strength for continuing to do that, you know, even through all that adversity. But I know your mom is looking down and she's like, thank you, uh, because <laughs> you are doing doing her life justice just by being you. Um, so definitely. Um, the next question I wanted to ask you is what is your advice to other people, entrepreneurs trying to break into the fashion and design industry? Um, I would say the biggest thing is to be patient with yourself. Um, one of my, uh, my, my mentors, uh, she's my mentor, my merchandiser, her name is Twyla and, um, her group, um, creative collective, um, really helped me to understand the business side of fashion. Mm -hmm. I mean, you always know the business side and, you know, you study it and you're studying it from, the marketing perspective or from this, the perspective of working for a company is completely different than living in it as an owner. And so one of the things that's really important is, and what she told me, she was like, look, let's be clear. You're not an athlete. You're not an actress. You're not a singer. You're not a socialite. And I don't believe you have liquid $500,000. And I was like, well, so what does this mean? She was like, it means you will have to work very hard. You will have to be creative. You will have to think outside of the box on how to get um, awareness and get, you know, and really get clear and eyes on your brand. And, you know, when you start, you have all these grandiose ideas. Like when I first started, I must have had like 30 different bags on my site. It was a mess. And she looked at my site and she was like, so sis, we're going to need to pair this back. And she's giving me all this really valuable, real advice. But as a creative, I was like, no, she's not telling me this. I can't believe it. And 
gr- temper tantrums, growing pains. I'd be like, well, I'm just gonna go now. And I would hang up. I'd be like, girl, I'm gonna, it's rude to have someone say so. Twi- I'm going to have to say goodbye. And I will, will, I'll see if I'll call you later. Okay, five years later. So, <laughs> but I would say, you know, one of the, you know, kind of giving yourself being patient, having a really good team that's not going to just tell you what you want to hear, but tell you what you need to hear. So you yep. don't waste your time and your money and everything. Um, the next, uh, the next thing is, you know, really, um, I hope that anyone who starts a business has an overnight success and can say, you yeah. know, it was like a matter of weeks or more, and we blew up. I wish, I hope that for anyone who starts a business, but the reality is that's not necessarily what's going to happen, but know that if you started your company for the right reason, that with time and with hard work and patience, it will come. It might not come when you want it to, but it will happen. Yeah, and honestly, I think the danger in looking at entrepreneurship like an overnight success is that you forget all the lessons that you learn on the way. You know, all those failures, all those things prepares you, gives you new skills, helps you learn how to work with people, helps you learn how to be resourceful, helps you learn how to adapt. So Mm -hmm. I mean, it's a journey, you know what I mean? And if you blow up over what the what else do you really what what is there to work towards? Uh, so I think Very, you, have, yeah. you have to reframe your mind to really appreciate kind of where you're at and how you are going to blossom over the course of your um, entrepreneurship. So um, with that, I wanted to ask my final question, which okay. is what is the hardest thing you're facing right now? And what are some kind of inspiring words that you can leave us with? I was like, this damn corona. Oh, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, come on. This COVID, this COVID-19. Um, I would say, well, for me, honestly, the, the biggest thing for me is, is time. Mm. And not just time from the perspective of there's not enough hours in the day, but time and being able to allocate it towards things that I wanted, you know, I wanted to go towards. And then the other challenge is understanding any technology because let me tell you with all of these virtual trade shows mm. i am so sick of screens i am just like oh, the tech side of things creating ai i'm looking at video games like so is that what they want they want me to call oh, my lord there's no way um we are gonna we i want to go to bible study every day and i haven't been in years but <laughs> it's tough it's a new world we're adapting to Yes, I would, I would definitely say, um, yeah, that's, that's it. But I think there's also a beauty in it because you learn how to transition and um, it really does cause you to kind of like reach back. So now let me tell you, the children, give me the 16 year old, hand, hand me, if you have a 16 year old, eight, the eight, the 16, the 21, I'd be like, child, I'd be like, look, let's go. Bring, bring me the babies, bring me the babies. I will teach them the business, teach me this tech. Matter of fact, don't teach me the tech, just show me how it works. And <laughs> I'm so ready to be an auntie. I'm like, yes, come on, babies, let's go. Show, show auntie how to do this because I feel like their brains are just wired differently and I love it. I think it's absolutely fascinating. Um, and then as far as pearls of wisdom, I would just say, make sure you find your little pieces of peace yeah. because being an entrepreneur is rough. It is not going to be stable. It will test your constitution, um, your ethics. I think when you're an entrepreneur, who you are as a person, who your character is definitely comes out because there are times where, you know, you, um, you have to share and you have to be open. And if you're not innately that kind of person, it's going to be harder for you to advance because if you're not willing to share, then they're going to people be people who aren't willing to share with you. And it takes a team effort, even as an entrepreneur, it takes a team effort to be able to be successful. And I can say, I have girlfriends who are one of my really good girlfriends and I learn from her often uh she makes handbags too we have a different aesthetic but we both um you know listen to each other and 
when I first started my company, she was having issues with trying to find sourcing and working. And now, um, so I turned her onto my manufacturing and then later on I built my manufacturing. So now we both go to the same place. We both, she manufactures mm -hmm. in my company. I, you know, but we have an understanding, like there's an also mutual level of respect. I would never look at her designs and never use her, you know, things like that. So that's where I think having your own character and ethically, you have to have a very strong constitution and being an entrepreneur man actually magnifies that. And so just being solid makes a difference. I mean, because you said it all, like you, you said, you said all the advice. Um, I definitely agree with you so much, especially when you mentioned, you know, finding your peace because it, it will test your constitution. I love that. I may feel that because, you know, um, it's ups and downs internally, externally. You have to be able to show up and show out and know how mm -hmm. to work with people. You have to, you know, give it to the fear so you can share your work because people will always have opinions on what they think or whatever, but then you also have, you can't do it all alone. So you have to share and work with others and get advice. I mean, it's, yeah. it's, a, it's a roller coaster of a, of a thing, but I really am inspired by creative entrepreneurs all over, uh, hence why I'm so uh, <laughs> exhilarated with meeting with you. And uh, it's really been a pleasure of this interview um, I thank you so, so much for being on this episode. I call it Diaspora thank Diva. You. I think that you're oh. Diva. <laughs> and, uh, you know, definitely um, it's clear that you are part of Diaspora and your contributions will not go unnoticed. And uh, yeah, please support uh, Miss Kapenzi and you can find <laughs> her on all social media at Lineage Inc. So L-I-N-E-I-J-I-N-C. She also has a beautiful website. And uh, Kapinzi, I'm gonna let you say the website because <laughs> I could, but. <laughs> so it's, it's Lineage Atelier and it's L-I-N-E-I-J dash A-T-E-L-I-E-R.com. Awesome. Thank you so, so much, Kapenzi. Again, it's been great chatting with you. Thank you for having me. I'm so excited. I can't wait to like watch it and share. I'm excited. <laughs>